in a sec. All right, hello YouTube. Welcome to another episode of Backstory. Oh, where I forgot to set up the audio the way that it's supposed to be so that you will actually be able to hear Sean. One moment. Aren't you glad I did it before we started recording the podcast this time? One second, everybody. This is exciting. As much of a, a, a pain in the ass as it can be sometimes, I am really glad that my, that my microphone will do this at all. Uh, go ahead, Sean. Hello, then. <laughs> did you just try and talk in a Cockney accent? I did. Fantastic. What is happening with my... All right. Sound check again. Go ahead, Sean. Hello, then. <laughs> Merry Poppins. Uh, a little bit, a little bit more for sound check. One more time. Um, okay, in a regular way. Yeah. This is, is this all part of the exciting episode? This is so exciting. YouTube people are so happy when things like this go on. I'm so glad I did not press record yet. Uh, yeah. Uh, so this is Backstory. Uh, if you're not already familiar with it, it's a uh, Sterling and Stone FM All right, hello, you two. Welcome podcast. to Ast, where we uh, we talk about how uh, what went into making the books that we make and that we write. And today we are going to be talking about uh, Darkfire, which for anybody who's not already familiar, is the third book in the Nightblade epic. Uh, which is a book in Legendary Books, a, a an imprint of Sterling and Stone. Um, and I'm here as uh, as in past episodes with Sean. So, what up? All right, and sorry, YouTubers, you're going to hear that uh, a variation of that intro again. <laughs> I'm, starting the, I'm starting the podcast audio now. All right, welcome back to Backstory, where we talk about the creation of books uh, written by Sterling and Stone from beginning to end, and what went into the thought process and, and the writing of the books. And today we're talking about Darkfire, the third book of the Nightblade epic. So uh, yeah, here we are, uh, three books in, and this is, this is, I think, when things really start getting kind of... Uh, kind of epic in the series um and uh, that was sort of your reaction when you first went through and and, and read the book right sean well yeah I, I feel like this is the um uh the scope just gets bigger you know we're really pulling back the camera uh, with each book and i feel like you know it just keeps going back 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 and you're seeing the world you know it's like that thing where uh, i mean the wire does this really well right where you um you've seen the wire right well, no, funny story about that, which I, I, I wasn't going to kind of get into, but like I was I kept waiting for The Wire to appear on Netflix. And then I finally found out like a week ago that it's an HBO show. And oh, I, yeah, it's never going to be on Netflix. Yeah, like I have HBO and I could have watched it this whole time. So now I am finally watching it and it is amazing. It is so oh, good. It's the best. It's, it's so good. Anyway, so are you are you on season one? Season one, like episode two, like okay, barely okay. in. Yeah. So, so what the wire does really well is it starts where uh, you're you're in this little tiny neighborhood and you're just seeing how things work there. And then season two, the camera pulls back and you're seeing more of Baltimore. And now it's the uh, it's the police, and then it's the docs, and then it's the teachers, and then it's the um, the you know journalists. And you're just seeing more angles and, and more perspective and, and how everything works together. And it's really fascinating. So, you know, the, the a smaller analogy is, you know, you've seen movies have done this, TV commercials have done this. There's kids playing on the playground and then the camera backs up and you see the playground as part of a neighborhood. And then it backs up and you see there's a, a whole city there and then it backs up and there's a country and then the world, right? And, and I feel like with each... Um, subsequent Nightblade book, the camera is is pulling back, and you're seeing a little bit more of the world. And Lauren started in Nightblade; it was it was tiny. You know, she's just this little village in the Birchwood, and you know, she gets out of there and sees her first city in Cabras. Oh my God! But <laughs> Cabras is kind of a shitty little city, <laughs> <It's> no <laughs> right? And then you're seeing more and more. And uh, you know, I, I think that by the time we get to Darkfire. Um, it's not just bigger. There's not just more scope there, but there's more to the world. You know, you're, we see the shades, you know, we see this fortress. There's, 
there's just so much more um, darkness. Um, and, you know, we, we, we have a tragedy at the end of the book. Yeah, obviously, um, uh, we haven't said this yet, but spoiler, uh, and Darkfire is the first book where I'd say there's pretty massive spoilers. Like, if you yeah, haven't they're, read they're, Darkfire, they're, yeah, don't, you, you do not want this spoiler. It will ruin the experience. But, but you know, I, I feel like the, I mean, can I just go ahead and say it? Like, yeah, well, now now that we've said that, like, right. you should have t- taken your headphones off already. <laughs> so the, the death of Jordell is... Um, is earned you know it's not it's not there for shock value oh so he deserved it okay (laughs) (laughs) well i'm not saying he deserved it but i I think that the book worked hard to get the reader to that point where there's a lot of um dramatic impact and it doesn't feel in any way cheap you know it feels emotional you know gem is emotional we're emotional um you know it's 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 hard Mm -hmm. you know it's hard to see all that happen i mean zane who we saw be a total asshole you know, in in the previous book is, you know, he less he, of an asshole at the end. <laughs> yeah, right. He, you know, he, that that he does the touching inscription, which Lauren can't even read. And, right. you know, all, all of that is just um, there's more depth to this book um, than the others before it. And I think it does a, a, a elegant job of setting up Shadeborn. Yeah. Um, so the, the, the thing that I knew when I went into uh, when I went into Darkfire was that uh, I had been uh, hinting at the at the existence of this this dark thing that Jordel knew was coming and had told Zane about. Like I'd been hinting at it this whole time because, and the reason that I didn't want to reveal it was I it, that is that is the big epic series, um, which you know the, the we're still calling it the Umbrella series. The name has not yet been revealed. Um, dun 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 dun. And, uh, and I, I, I still wasn't ready for the Umbrella series. And there was no point talking about the big bad, the big thing that was happening until, you know, if it just dragged on and on and on and people knew what it was, then it would be like, well, just get to that, right? So, you know, having it in as a, as a layer consistently throughout, uh, throughout the books, I thought was just a, a better solution for handling that. But by the time Darkfire uh, happened... I knew I was close. I knew I like I knew I still wasn't quite ready, but I knew I was getting there and I knew that within a few books I was going to be ready to write the big epic series. So it was it was time to reveal not quite the big bad, but the big bad's presence in a very tangible sense, not just something that Jordell keeps talking about, but an actual physical presence in in the form of the shades and the stronghold in the mountains that um, that you know Jordell didn't even know was there, uh, but looked like a mystic stronghold. So how did he not know about it and all that sort of thing? And so the the full the full revelation still doesn't come by the end of the book. Although of course Zane already knows it and and Lauren gets a little bit of uh, of a taste of it. But um, but that that was sort of what. When, what I went into the beginning of Darkfire with was um, was knowing okay we need to we need to have them here as a tangible presence because now they are going to like up until this point Lauren because she's on such a personal journey and because she has she's dealing with sort of like small small fry you know the family Yaren is like powerful and influential but really you know like it's not like the entire family Yaren is plotting the overthrow of the Nine Kingdoms or even that all of them are focused on finding and killing Lauren. It's pretty much just Damaris and her, you know, like she's going to use her contacts and whatever, but most of the family Yaren is probably like, oh, whatever. Like, well, th- most of the family Yaren could give a shit. Yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> like, they don't care. It's like, it's, it's like if, um, you know, I don't know, a big mob family, right? Like somebody has a, a beef with someone at the gas station. Right. <laughs> They're not involved in the family in that. Like, yeah. you go take care of your business, whatever, right. Marcelo. Like, I don't need to get involved. <laughs> yeah. Um, but actually, uh, uh, I just love that. Is that a juice box? It looks like a juice box. I've had this for- oh, it's the cup from the side. It looked like a re- it looks like a box because I could only see the red. Yeah, like uh, that. That uh, looks like a ju- <laughs> juice box. No, it's it's my it's my classic Hunger Games. I've had this for what four years now. Yeah, no, now now I recognize it. Sorry, audio feed. Uh, Sean was just drinking from his Hunger Games cup, and it looked it looked my, my like juice a box. It looked my like a Mott's apple juice box. Thirty-two ounce juice box. <laughs> <laughs> Illegal in New York. Um, so, uh, but anyway, a thing that was a surprise to me, uh, like 
I didn't know this was going to happen until I was halfway through the second draft of Darkfire, I think, or maybe maybe halfway through the first draft. But uh, there's a moment in Vlog a Novel, which if you don't know what that is, uh, Vlog a Novel is my YouTube channel where I literally live stream the creation of the book from beginning to end. And you can see everything. You can see the outlining, um, the first draft, editing, formatting. It's all there. And so I'm halfway through writing the book. And I just like you can see it where I stop and I go, oh, no, because I realized Jordell has to die. He ha he actually kind of has to like for a, for a variety of reasons, a lot of which are are story based. Um, for one thing, Lauren is going to is going to go in a few different directions in uh, books four, five, and six, right? Because, like, night, you know, the Nightblade epic is basically, like, a series of trilogies. Each three books is one major story arc. And I re I knew what her story arc was going to be in four, five, and six. And I knew that I knew that it was not possible as long as Jordell was around because she has to... Um, she has to be her own person. She can't... Well, this is... This is very well established in in lore and storytelling right obi-wan kenobi has to die right for luke skywalker to you know be the jedi he needs to be exactly right? like the, the the master has to die so the apprentice can then move on yeah and and you you even see it in times where you think that you don't where like gandalf dies and it's like oh well but he comes back but frodo doesn't even know that like right the fact that he he comes back doesn't in any way diminish the value of his death, right? Um, and a lot of people, a lot of people actually don't realize that about Lord of the Rings. But Frodo didn't know Gandalf was alive the entire time until he had <laughs> already thrown the ring in, and then he came and picked him up on the eagles and brought him back to Gan uh, Gondor. And he's like, "You're alive!" And Gan and everybody else is like, "Oh yeah, we've known that for some time." So I guess it wouldn't really, yeah. Okay, cool. There you go. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah. So so unfortunately. Um, you know, Jordell had 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 to uh, had to go, and um, and what's funny about that is, I feel like because it was a surprise to me, it is. A, I I've had a lot of people say that it was a surprise to them, like because there are things that you do, there are things that you do in storytelling, like to like prepare for a character's death, right? Like if it's a TV show, you're gonna have That's two. That's where you get the sentimental episode with that. That one gets a lot more screen time all of a sudden. Yeah, like one yeah. character starts getting uh, gets a couple episodes in a row where they're showing up a lot and they have a really cool arc for two or three episodes, and you're like, oh no, what's gonna happen? Like yeah, they're clearly wearing a bullseye. Yeah, completely. And this guy, like this guy's gonna die. And. I, I, I did a little bit of that. Like there's, you know, you get a little bit more backstory on Jordell. You get a little bit more personal with him, but yeah, I didn't. But, but it wasn't broadcast in a way that right. you had to worry about his. It, it, it was it was exposition. It yeah. was well-placed exposition. Like we needed to know more about the, the mystics. We needed to know more about the world. Right. And so it all made sense that, okay, we're, we're learning. You know, we're understanding. And, and any reader of Darkfire is going to be eager to absorb those details at that point. Right. So they're not looking at it as, oh, Jordell's in danger. They're looking at it as, I've been hungry for this information and now it's being given to me. And also, a lot of Jordell's increased backstory and increased, uh, like, a, another way that this uh, that this worked to, to be, um, and, and like I said, this was completely unintentional, but a lot of the way that it worked to be more surprising and to be less expected was that it's all framed around Zane. Everything that we learn about Jordell is all framed in his relationship to Zane. Um, where he visited him after Zane saved the Lord Prince, and where he, uh, you know, where we find out that he is, um, he's the brother, Jordel is the brother of the woman that Zane loved, who now got married off to somebody else, and he's actually the uncle of Zane's son, you know, Zane's child by, by blood. So we learn all these things about Jordel, and we find out all these cool details about, like, stuff that he did a long time ago, and, 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 but it's all about, like, how he interacted with Zane. So we think we actually like it it kind of tricks you into thinking that you're learning more details about Zane while you're at the same time being fed more and more about about Jordell. So um so like I said, completely unintentional, but I really like how it how it sort of ended up happening. Um Yeah, it, it's always great when something as the author catches you by surprise because you know it's going to have more impact, you yeah. know. Where you start the stuff that's in your beats before you actually start the story. Right. Those are your raw materials. But 
a lot of that ends up being so what you know maybe you use two thirds of them if your outline is really strong right but then it's all the the surprise stuff that that happens and and that happens when you're writing the outline too you know you have a, a, a you go going from the story concept to the actual finished product that a reader ha is holding in their hands there's so much in between those two things you know there's there's the the actual discovery that happens in the outline when you're when you're realizing oh there's there's more to this character or there's more to this world or there's more to these relationships than than I saw and you're that fleshes out in the outline but then in the story itself too you know people say things that surprise you they make decisions that surprise you and that's always um, I don't know that to me that's the, the really layered stuff what was something like that in Darkfire I mean beyond Joydell's death but what were the the little surprises that um, that took the story, maybe the stuff that set up Shadeborn in, in, in a way. Well, uh, one, th I don't know that this that this applies to the other stuff, but um, Triskin was a big setup for Shadeborn. Although I'll talk about why exactly that was um, later. But um, actually, one of the coolest things and one of the biggest one of the biggest surprises and like important lessons to me um, as a writer and going forward in the series didn't actually happen in the writing, but in the beta reading. I had beta readers for Darkfire, uh, many of whom are people who tune in and watch Vlog a Novel, uh, people like Kristen Stevens and Jessamine Hack, and um, Jessamine? Jessamine, it is. I just, uh, Jess, and uh, uh, Alex Pedro, and, and all these, all these like, awesome, awesome people who, like, you know, really like the series and just, like, are, are my favorite people because I can just talk to them, like, about... Hey, so you know when blah blah did this thing, and they're like, uh huh, and I'm like, oh, thank God, like I, I don't yeah. have that many people I can talk to about it. Um, so they did, they did beta reading, and what really surprised me was, um, in the in the draft that they got, which was you know a very early draft and, and wasn't in the final thing, they hated Annis so much, and I didn't in in Darkfire specifically in Darkfire specifically, um, she was. And and like when you go back and you read that early draft, she was a such a hateable character because she just um, why because she was really whiny. She was she was she was whiny and she was also like uh, she was she was unrelatably angry at Zane like all the time. Like she was constantly like we should leave him behind. We should kill to him. Be we should fair. He did burn her. Yes, but what they made me realize was. That would, she had no compassion or no empathy, no ability to forgive? No. Would that make her super pissed off at him all the time, this little 12-year-old girl? Or would that make her, like, PTSD terrified of him? Like, terrified half, of him, yeah. Exactly. And, and so the way that it came, the, the way that it, like, that it sort of morphed into, into that, that draft, which, you know, looking back on it, 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 it was not good. Um, and, and the way that it, uh, basically, it turned her into, like, like... She doesn't want to, she doesn't want to, you know, counterman Lauren, and she doesn't want to, like, not be a team player, but she's got this building just, like, li like, this building sense of, like, can't you all see how stupid this is that we're with him? Like, he, he, like, she's terrified. She's terrified. He could that turn us on us at any time, because he already has. Right, exactly. And so it does, it does burst forth as anger at one point but for the most time she sees it is like she has she has not terrible nightmares about it she can't stop thinking about it she see you know she she pictures it in her mind all the time like you actually do when you have ptsd it's not she's not a she's not a, a vengeful person she's like she's 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 seen a lot of bad stuff but she's not like she she doesn't know how to handle being like personally attacked because all the bad stuff that she's seen is bad stuff that her family has well, been she's doing been witness to it exactly she, hasn't been, she hasn't been the target and now she's even more like b where before she was like my family and what my mom's doing is all terrible now she's like she has a, an exact realization of how terrible it is because she knows what it's like to be the victim of it well, um, it's a big difference watching a shark attack and then being in the water with a shark. Like, yes. <laughs> they're very different things. And she spent her whole life. I mean, one and, of them gets your heart. One of them gets your heart racing. The other one makes you crap your scuba suit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think that that's that's where that's where we've seen Annis. You know, she's she had to you know, she's watched her mother poison people and her, you know, father. Like, I mean, there's some really horrible backstory there. And I, I, is it in Darkfire where we learn that stuff? 
It's some of it. It's been laced throughout. Like she, she talks in Mystic a little bit about how her mom used to used to ask her to help her. Like ask, do you want to help me like torture this guy? Yeah. When she was right. like little, and it's just like what the hell, right? Yeah, and that tells you a lot about both Damaris, but also um, also Anna. It's like, yeah. I, I, what, what, who would you be if that's how you grew up? Yeah. You know, like it's. It's it's kind of a miracle that she is as grounded as she is. Yeah, exactly. and so you know, like for I'm very sympathetic towards Annis. Now I didn't read the original draft, <laughs> so maybe I would have oh, been no. with her too. Yeah, I'm but, sure you would have. When I like, it, it, it's one of those things where I went back and I was like, did I really like, write? What this? was I thinking? Yeah, exactly. What was I thinking? How could I have written this this way? It's so not good. So she. So. I've just I've always felt very sympathetic towards her because I think it takes a lot of courage to stand up to your family and to yeah. be someone different than them, which is, you know, I, I know this isn't the right place to talk about really in depth anyway, but but a big theme in the upcoming series that we have. Yeah. You know, oh, very much it. so. Yeah. Yeah. And and, and I, I love that theme. I think that because I think a lot of people can relate to that, you know, and it's it's not it's the, not the same, but it kind of is, you yeah. know, where like, let's say you know, you're a third generation lawyer, you know, everyone's been lawyer, they've all gone to X school, and you're supposed to go there and you're supposed to just tow the party line and become, you know, uh, you know, one of the people in our, um, our, uh, our, our, our mastermind, right? He's a doctor, his family's doctor, they've always been doctors, he's supposed to be a doctor, but he wants to create, he wants to do cool things. And it's very difficult to stand up and say, that's great that that's who you guys are but i'm someone different and i think yeah. that that makes anna's a really strong character because it, some people can't figure that out until they're adults and she's figuring it out at a very young age she's saying i'm not comfortable with ho- who all of you are and that's not who i want to be and she sees lauren back in nightblade and says i i know you're gonna run i want to run with you right wherever you go i want to go and that takes i think tremendous courage to stand against her family in that way so i love annis and you know but i'm glad i didn't read the the draft that would have made me hate her yeah me but, too uh, it's uh the the thing that i most liken it to is like i and i have a lot of good friends who are in this exact situation um where like if your family's like super conservative like and i'm not just like super conservative like to the point where they're kind of like you know like racist and like you know like that that crazy right wing hyper conservatism but you grew up as a child of the internet and so you have like a slightly more complex view of humanity and the world and like and and how you think things should run and like I know a lot of people who are in that exact situation and it's like, yeah, you know, I, I, I go to my family reunions and everybody's talking about, you know, how bad the president is and how bad these people are, you know, and by these people, I mean these people. And it's just like, that's really, really rough. And how do you deal with that? You know, like these are literally your family. You've known them your entire life. And like, you're supposed to like, especially for your parents and your grandparents and everything, you're supposed to like treat them with respect and whatever. But like, uh, so so well, anyway it's one of those things where you can't choose your family but you can choose your friends and Annis realizes that much earlier than most other people exactly and she sees lauren and she wants to make an ally and she sees you know and, and zane you know and, and let's not forget in those first books as much of, as an asshole as, as zane has been he does take care of Annis early on he does get her out of cabras right you know so you know but then he turns on her right. and that's betrayal and that's very hard to trust afterwards so i love that arc i love that she has to to learn that and you know i mean we'll talk next time when we we talk in the shadeborn yeah you know, where that that where that goes but but i love that arc and i love i love we should actually talk about triskin because yeah uh, so let's get on to triskin because nah. <laughs> I, I was I, when I was reading this for the first time, and I, I'm waiting to see the old. You know, I love the set. You know, I I I read very visually, right? So I'm I'm picturing this all, and I, I love the set of um the the abandoned castle, mm-hmm. right? And and I've read this before. The you know I've read it in sci-fi. I've read it and it, I've read it before. The old abandoned thing that is now inhabited. Mm-hmm. That's really scary. You know, you've seen it in comic books, the old abandoned fairgrounds that yeah. some evil villain has now occupied, right? And there's something really scary about this thing that was once there and now it's been abandoned and now it's been like reclaimed by this horrible, you know, evil presence. And just the fact that you don't know going into it what's there, 
um, is scary. Yeah. And but it's not just that someone has like kind of staked the claim on this old abandoned castle. It's that they're there in big numbers. Right. Right. And then the first glimpse we get of Triskin, we know he's dangerous as shit. Like we know that right away. And then the family Yaren is there, like selling these evil mage stones. Like, okay, well they're here. There's something really, really bad going on here. And and I think that was all really well set up that by the time we see Triskin and we see that Damaris is here with with, you know, her evil Gregor henchman and <laughs> and just wagons and wagons and wagons full of uh mage stones we just like all the elements are there that we're we're a little bit scared we're scared for our party yeah yeah and um and in in that like sort of that fear and that um uh that you know sense of unease and sense of uh of something dangerous is happening here triskin had to be the embodiment of it right he had to embody everything uh, that we were supposed to be afraid of and we're supposed to um you know like like where did he come from like that sort of like and 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 to a larger sense where did all these people come from what is their story where did the shades like who do they work for um because jordel obviously seems to know but pretty much from the moment he finds out until the end of the book they barely have a spare second for him to be able to sit down and explain it to lauren mm -hmm. which he also kind of doesn't want to do because it's like really dangerous knowledge to have flying around and it's like i i you know, like well, it makes her a target. Exactly. But, but you, you do some really great things in that book that that tell the reader how much um, Joydell knows in like these really just whatever I'm so cool casual way. Like <laughs> I could tell you where the last cobblestone is. I remember the exact line, but 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 he knows this fortress. He knows right. it inside and out because you know it's 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 a it was once a mystic fortress, and I think that. The quiet subtext there that the shades are mystics upside down, right? Uh, is 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 just very well placed. Yeah, um, and uh, and it goes into uh, again things that are explained and explored more in Shadeborn, but it, it but it is that flipped nature where it's like the mystics wear red and the shades wear blue, and it's like and 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 uh, but as as terrifying as Triskin needs to be right off the bat, and. And as much as he is basically, he is basically the Shades version of, of, of Jordel. He's a powerful captain who seems to know a lot, who, you know, works like for, for the higher up, whoever his higher up is, is obviously somebody very powerful and important, just like Jordel is within the Mystics, but he, but Triskin has the advantage and we don't understand what that advantage is. And that makes him more powerful and more terrifying. But his counterpoint is the Shades that they do meet because they meet and have actual interactions with these people and they realize the vast majority of them just like anybody else they're just they're just people you know they're just like they come in and they have uniforms and you know some of the shades are like blah, 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 and they're like oh how villainous these people are and then one of them's like ignore them they're fucking assholes you're new here right hi i'm you know i'm blah 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 okay cool Gr yeah, good to meet you yeah and when that guy gets you know shivved yeah <laughs> Um, you know, that may be the only time that Jordell did something where I was like, come on, dude. Yeah. But, like, it's not like he really had a choice. He didn't. I mean, you know, he could have knocked him over the head, which, like, if it was a Disney movie, he would have knocked him over the head and put him in the closet, right? Yeah. But that's not realistic. Yeah. And, you know, he, Jordell handled it like Jordell should have handled it. But still, it was like, I understood Lauren's pain in that moment because she was not cool with that decision yeah. and and i understood why because she had it, lunch with the guy right right yeah it's that simple like the and it's so stupid because that didn't minimize his danger to them right at all right and it could have been anybody else and any any other soldier it would have been fine of course you have to kill him but the fact that they broke bread even for five minutes yeah it, it made this thing that that she was more upset about it and i think that most readers would be too and it makes perfect sense why yeah so um so that all that all progresses and and, and takes on uh, other dimensions in shadeborn and and triskin triskin had a more important job than just being the big bad in in Darkfire and being the one to to eventually like cause the end of Jordel, um, but 
that that bigger role is something uh, that 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 does come out in Shadeborn. So we will uh, we will talk about that in the next episode, um, which uh, we're not sure exactly when we're going to record it, but uh, we're going to record it at some point soon. soon. Yeah, soon. So keep an eye on the YouTube channel. The one thing that I want to end off with uh, that was a hilarious reaction, to, not hilarious, like actually kind of heartbreaking um, reaction to Jordell's death is that less people were upset by the simple fact that Jordell was dead then people were upset at Jem's reaction, at how badly it hurt Jem. That was yeah, what... Yeah, but that actually makes sense. Yeah. Because, because the thing is, Jordel, you know, he's he's a big man. Yeah. And he knows the danger. And he's lived a lot of, you know, he's been all across the Nine Lands. He, right. He kind of understood the gravity and the risk and all of that. Jem is a child. Yeah. You know, and, and Jem... Because he's so boastful, it actually makes it more heartbreaking because, yeah. you know, he's just, he is just a child. And when he has to retreat into himself, it's, it is heartbreaking. You yeah. don't, it, it's always more painful to see a child go through something traumatic like that. And what that was actually um, directly taken off of, that had a, that had a direct inspiration, which was my own personal experience of watching Breaking Bad. Uh, when Walt gets discovered and the whole thing comes out and everybody knows he's a criminal now. Who cares? Like, Walt's just like, Sh well, I have to get out of this situation. I have to flee. I have to escape. But the, the, t the moment where he talks to Walt Jr. and Walt Jr. flips out and is like, I never want to hear from you again. You're scum. Like his son. That was when I was like, oh, God, my heart. And that was what, that was what I was trying oh, to do. Got chills. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Can you it, like because well, I mean it's probably different for me like having kids but like the um, just imagining going through that and of course Brian Cranston played the the reaction in that scene perfectly and it's just it hurts so bad seeing that happen so that's where that came from in case you were and then wondering. when he calls him yeah. later and and you expect like okay now everything's gonna be okay and it's no not, <laughs> not even a yeah. little bit really ballsy storytelling there yeah so anyway there you go well I, I'm excited to talk about Shadeboard next time because. Um, you know, the, these books, they, they get better. And Shadeborn is my favorite so far. So there's the there's the most world building there, too. Um, you know what we were talking about at the, the beginning of the episode where the camera keeps pulling back? You know, it pulls back a lot. And you see a lot of the nine the nine kingdoms. And yeah. I think that that's, that, that's really exciting. Shadeborn's, so we'll definitely, the Shadeborn's definitely the biggest zoom out. Um, and, uh, yeah, okay, we'll talk about it more later. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for listening. So that's Backstory. Uh, thanks so much for listening, and uh, keep your ears peeled for the episode of Shadeborn coming as soon as we can get it to you. Adios. Yay, 30 minutes and 34 seconds. Like oh, that. perfect. All right, so YouTube, uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for watching. There's my camera. Um, we are going to log off. We were supposed to do Shadeborn today, but then I had a problem at the post office, which I will <laughs> bitch about in another context because this is not the right place to do it. Stupid post office. Stupid post office. Oh, my God. So upset. Um, yeah. So uh, thanks so much for watching. And by the way, Kristen I, I, and, and Queen Wolfart, I did see your live comments. Thank you so much for those. As usual, since we're recording a podcast, we can't really answer them on the air um, because it's 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 something for the audio feed. But um, yeah, uh, I'll be doing vlog and novel and whatever, and I'll see you guys uh, very soon. So thanks for watching. Bye. Bye.